All right. So what I what do I, how I want to start this is that I want you all to just, just sort of for a minute or two, think about being with your partner. You happen to be in Venice. The night is falling. Uh, the lights are going down. Uh, there's a wind coming up. And uh, you can you notice that because the gondolas are waving and going up and down and up and down. You also can feel that there's something in the air. It's salty and you're, the wind is sort of hitting your faces a little bit. But you're sort of out very close to the Adriatic looking over the, the canal and you feel that there's a storm coming on. Storm over Venice. The night in Venice was clear and crisp. Whispers of light announce you're coming. Storm, storm, wind blown, rain filled. Echoing off the old stones. Light will not change them. Rain will not harm them. They don't even notice our footsteps. The rain will wash us away. I remember the night with a certain passion, a true lust for the storm, the time, the light. Looking out, the lightning illustrates a crack in time. We are here. People have been in this very spot for centuries, have seen and experienced the same storm, have listened to the music of the square, have felt the same sun. God, we must go on. A thread of us all flow, throws through each storm, I'm convinced. The storm cannot be for us alone. It is to tell us of all the others who have lived their time as it should be lived. We flee when the rain tumbles from the sky. We race along the narrow streets. The footing is wet. We laugh with the rain. The rain is hidden with time, impregnant with dews of eternity. We race to the second floor loft, find the door, wet hair, laughing, and in awe. We have touched the face and it is smiled on us. Now, that's one of a series of poems I initially sent to be published about 25 years ago. And this is what I got back. You can see here that the second one is Storm Over Venice, and it was rejected. Uh, you'll hear another one on restoring Leonardo's Da Vinci's Last Supper. Uh, they liked it a little bit, it was on file, but it never got published. And there's another one that did get published, which is Tucupan. But it's interesting what he basically says here, and that's where I got the, um, where I got the topic for my uh, presentation. And he says, your poetry searches for meaning. Send more poems in the future. So this particular presentation result comes from a, um, a workshop I did uh, for a group in Calgary. And the workshop was entitled Poetry, Art, and Neurosurgery, A Search for Meaning. Numbers of individuals have been in, in the lab and, and um, this big blackboard we write on occasion really is, is another way that I guess we all search for meaning, at least as far as science is concerned. So I'm gonna just talk about a, a number of different areas, a bit about beginnings and evolution. I'm gonna put a fair amount of effort on the importance of mentors some effort on pitfalls and challenges associated with a medical career or any other type of career. Uh, the question of medicine being a uh, calling or is it a job? 
and a little bit about life after medicine and in my situation, life after neurosurgery. I'm gonna spr sprinkle a few poems through it to sort of make it a little bit more um, interesting, let me put it that way. So beginnings and evolution. Well, each of us <clears throat> is informed by a series of continuously challenging life experiences, beginning as children and through adolescence, which form a basis for our, our evolution into the adulthood. adulthood. Parents, family, and friends are the core of this time and define our future development. This is my daughter, Lana, along with Everly. I saw Everly today. She's a little bit older than this at the present time. But it's always amazing to me how children are born and grow. And this is me. This is my beginning. This is my mother and I. <clears throat> we had... Um, arrived from Italy uh, in Halifax. Uh, I was about a three-year-old at that time. My father had come to uh, Canada about six months earlier. I don't have a great deal of memory for this particular time frame, but I do remember a few things. One, the, the boat was massive, and I'd been born in a small little village in the northern part of Italy, and seeing something like a boat must have been, you know, influence on me since I still remember it as this great big sort of gray glob somehow in my mind. My mother um, and I arrived in Halifax on the 24th of January, 1952. And my mother spoke not a word of, of English. Of course, I didn't either. And somehow we got on a train. And on Christmas day, we're, we arrived in Montreal. It's interesting that I go back to Montreal every once in a while. So it's sort of a circle that closes, I guess. Uh, on that particular train, obviously there wasn't uh, much of a Christmas, but I remember some oranges and other sort of uh, activities. And later we, we arrived in uh, Toronto where my father was. So this is my mother and father. My father had spent six years in the war being in the Italian army. He had uh, developed Corf on Corfu uh, malaria. And uh, on Corfu, the Italian um, sort of regiment on Corfu, uh, when the Italians capitulated, had decided to, uh, to fight against the Germans. They actually turned coat. And uh, my father happened to be in the um, hospital at the time that the Germans uh, attacked Corfu to take it over again. Uh, my father was uh, not an officer, but he was higher in rank of sergeant. And uh, all this, everybody above the rank of private was killed by the uh, Germans, every Italian officer. Uh, so that obviously left somewhat of a interesting sort of uh, stain on my father and the time. And my father later would die from uh, the side, of, side effects of malaria. He had a severe carditis associated with malaria. The reason he wasn't killed like all the other uh, officers was that uh, he happened to be in the hospital at the time. However, uh, my father had uh, traveled to, uh, to Canada first, uh, worked in a farm. And uh, here you can see me and my mother and my father together again. Uh, at, uh, shortly after we got together. One of the things that was amazing about both my parents, but particularly my mother, was that uh, although she'd only gone to grade five, she had hoped to be able to go to become a teacher. Her, uh, her father, however, felt that uh, the best thing for her to do was to work on the farm, and so she never got to uh, express that particular joy in life. But at the same time, uh, every week from Italy arrived what was called Grand Hotel. It was a magazine. Uh, in that particular magazine, there were stories, there were pictures, uh, there was all kinds of different types of uh, issues associated with paintings. And uh, one that came in, my mother and I would sit down and we would go through it. And I'm sure that this had an influence on me related to the whole issue of my interest in art and other aspects of that. 
just sitting with my mother every week and going through and seeing what new things was in that particular uh, Grand Hotel magazine. Um, there's been some issues related to this particular magazine and others at the time that they were sort of a worthless escapism um, or were there some part of history. And from my point of view, they were certainly part of my history as I was growing up. Um, my mother also loved opera. I don't know if she'd ever actually heard an opera or seen an opera when she was in Italy, but obviously she somehow had a, had a significant interest in opera. And opera music was always playing when I was growing up, always coming out of the sort of record player. So a, an interesting beginning for me. This is my mother and father on the left, and you can see me in the corner here uh, with uh, a whole group of sort of uh, Italian immigrants that came at the same time. What was interesting when my father uh, came, I uh, came over with uh, five other men, none of whom were married. Uh, my father was the only one married. So we all lived together. And uh, for a period of my life, I had six fathers because um, they were all uh, there and my mother took care of all of us at that particular time period. Uh, moving on and the importance of mentors. Now, all of us have beginnings, everybody, uh, on, the, um, on this particular call has a beginning and how they started. But one of the questions that really is very important is how do we move on? How do we, how do we get past whatever we start with? And the importance of mentors, well, mentors can be a lot of things, but they can guide you, they can give you advice, feedback, they can support or, and serve variously as role models teachers, counselors, advisors, sponsors, advocates, and even an ally. And it really depends on one's specific goals and objectives. Now, some of you heard before about uh, my uh, mentor, Jarfos Havelka. Uh, Dr. Havelka was professor of uh, uh, psychology at Western. And um, his basic interest was the psychology of creativity. Uh, he was also an artist. And his art really involved two things. Uh, they involved uh, Christ's suffering, uh, and they also involved trees. So in one way, it's interesting. Uh, he always was uh, interested both in the, the issue of the suffering of man and also the beauty of the world. He spoke nine languages. And uh, in his courses on the psychology of creativity at Western, uh, you couldn't get into the course because uh, there were so many people who were there, but everybody went. He sat all over the, the floor and all over the back. And uh, he always brought in a, a folder. And in that particular folder, he, uh, he would put the folder on, on the podium and never, never open it. Uh, one day, one of, the, one of the students asked him, uh, Professor, why, why do you have this folder? So he went to the podium, he opens up the folder and uh, there was nothing in it. And he said, I have to carry this so that other uh, professors in my department feel that I, I talk from notes. And uh, he certainly did not talk from notes. He basically always uh, spoke about what, what his experiences were and, and um, what he believed related to the world. Now, when I was an intern, I decided that uh, I was going to take another course from Havelka. Uh, and taking a course, being an intern, was a bit difficult. I had to rearrange things, but it happened to be at night, so that wasn't too bad. Um, Havelka felt that uh, Mozart was the most creative person that had ever lived. And one of the reasons he felt that was that if you look at Mozart's music, there are no corrections, or very, very few corrections. And um, he felt that Mozart music came directly out of him. It was something that basically came from his mind to the page and then uh, uh, to the piano or other sort of areas that were uh, involved with it. Uh, however, uh, he believed, he didn't believe in marks and uh, you either passed or failed in his class. But in this particular class, we're associated with the um, psychology of uh, creativity. Uh, your job was to pick another individual who was not Mozart and 
have a number of one-on-one -on -one discussions with the professor in which you would try to outline why the person that you had chosen was more uh, creative than was Mozart. Now, this was sort of difficult because when you went into the classroom, Mozart, Mozart's music was playing. And when you left the classroom, Mozart's music was playing. So we set a pretty high bar. Now, there's all kinds of different types of music. for a second producing something like the magic flute uh, and having this played in front of uh, individuals of uh, substantial perform uh, importance such as the, uh, uh, the kings and other uh, important individuals. He uh, clearly changed music at the time, no question about that. So who was I going to choose? Well, one day when I was sort of uh, going through a bookstore, I came across a, a small pocket book uh, by Kenneth Clark on Leonardo da Vinci. It probably still is the best book that was ever written related to Leonardo da Vinci. And therefore, I, I found my champion. Had I been substantially interested in Leonardo before? No, no, it's, it basically started, it started here in that aspect of it. So, uh, I uh, might do particular one-on-ones um, -on with the professor. One of them happened to, do, happened to be Leonardo da Vinci in anatomy, and another Leonardo da Vinci in surprise, how Leonardo's work surprises you and how that affects your brain. Now, I got a very poor mark. And I think when I think back, I mean, I was an intern, I really didn't have a lot of time to sort of do as much work as probably I should have. Uh, but I think in one way, what the professor was trying to tell me was that I could have done better. And he outlined this, it actually came from that particular book. Uh, yet, just as Leonardo in his intellectual pursuits of natural forces, hung on with a kind of inspired tenacity so that in the St. John, we feel him pressing closer round the form, penetrating further and further into the mystery, till at last he seems to become a part of it. So that like his contemporaries, we no longer think of him as a scientist, a seeker for measurable truth, but as a magician, a man who, from his close familiarity with the processes of nature, has learned a disturbing secret of creation. Soon after that, I'd been in, in Italy a number of times. I had seen the, uh, the Last Supper. And uh, seeing the Last Supper again, if you look on the left, this is what it looked like. And then it was being cleaned. In the, in the process of cleaning, what they did is they, they cleaned parts of it. And they were trying to take off all the paint, over paint that had occurred over many, many centuries. And for periods of time, they left little squares so you could see what it looked like before and what it looked like after. And when they couldn't find any paint at all that was related to Leonardo's actual initial painting, they just filled in the, the whole area with just a color. When I saw this, and in particular, when I saw the individual who was using a microscope to sort of take off basically all the, uh, the paint that was over what Leonardo had initially painted, I was somewhat disturbed. Um, I was sort of almost frightened about what would happen if this particular individual continued to remove more and more and more paint until there was really basically nothing left. So that particular day, I wrote this poem. I'm restoring Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. The sadness is deep and touch my soul, hurt me. 
pearl upon pearl, the painting is removed. The bones may remain. They have little flesh. Leonardo, what have they done? The attempt you made still has some smoke, some fire. Hopefully, all will not be obscured by microscopic zeal. To find a few specks of your soul, the picture will appear to you A dream is evaporating into dust. Now, it didn't exactly evaporate into dust, if you look at it today, but it clearly is very different than it started with Leonardo and clearly very different than other times. But you can sort of feel what I'm feeling at the time that I, I, was, in, I was young then, and I think I really didn't quite understand what was happening. And I, I suppose this, this poem sort of outlines some of my heartache about not really understanding what was going on. Now, another individual who you've also uh, heard me talk about was uh, Dr. Charles Drake, who was, the, um, who was my uh, chairman related to neurosurgery and taught me majority of my work uh, and uh, studies associated with the art of neurosurgery. And uh, sometimes I consider medicine a bit of a poetry. And so to the poetry of medicine, Dr. Drake contributed a number of poems. He was particularly interested in vascular surgery. And so he contributed a lot to vascular surgery. Uh, interestingly, I did not have a great deal of interest in vascular surgery as far as neurosurgery was concerned, but moved into the area of brain tumors. Uh, Dr. Drake did not think there was any hope for brain tumors, especially the malignant brain tumors. Uh, he certainly outlined that to me. But there was another episode that I'll just talk to you about. And that episode related to the fact that uh, I think some people have heard me talk about this before. But uh, when I was in third year, I did not know whether I wanted to become a neurosurgeon or a neurologist or maybe something else. But I, Dr. Drake uh, was at Western, and I thought I would ask him. So I went to his secretary, and I asked the secretary if I could have a meeting with him, and she obliged rather amazingly. And uh, I arrived on the appointed day. He was in the office, and I walked in, and I sat down, and he looked at me, and he said, well, why are you here, son? And I said, well, I'm not exactly sure whether I want to be a neurosurgeon or I want to be a neurologist. And he looked at me sort of quietly and he said, you know, there's lots and lots of reasons why you shouldn't be a neurosurgeon. He said, many of your patients will not do very well. About half the neurosurgeons get divorced. And the worst part is that everybody will be around the family Everybody will come in on the Christmas to sort of celebrate. An accident will happen and you'll get up, operate all day. When you go back home, everybody's gone. And he went also and told me about the fact that many of the positions in neurosurgery had been filled. And there weren't gonna be much that one could do related to this in the future. But then he told me something that probably was the most important thing that someone has ever said to me, which was, people always make room for excellence. Think about that. People always make room for excellence. So if you're excellent at what you're doing, you'll always have a job. And in fact, people will look for you to give you a job. A few thoughts from him. I tell them uh, that work is the spice of life and that it does mean some hardship for their, for their uh, family, but uh, there's no alternative to it if, uh, if you're going to make your mark in surgery. Uh, I tell them, uh, at least to me, and I think to many other senior surgeons that I know, that the and another spice of life is to match your wits with the best in the game. Uh, those minds that are trying to do the same thing you are, to beat the disease and disorder that you face, to lick it. That's what it's all about. Here's a picture of myself uh, operating with Dr. Drake. 
there are many other individuals who um, uh, were involved in uh, teaching me surgery. Another individual who um, is not discussed very much is Dr. Um, Barr, Hugh Barr. He, uh, he had an incredible way of dealing with patients, dealing with patients, doctors, interacting with, with everyone. And uh, from him, I think I learned most about how to deal with uh, uh, the patient and care about the patient, uh, not as an object to be operated on, but really as a human being that had uh, sort of dreams and aspirations as all of us do. Now, another thing that I would significantly suggest to all of you who are interested in medicine is if you have the opportunity uh, during your uh, sort of in medical career in some way is to go somewhere else, to sort of experience another sort of way of doing things. So you're not stuck in, with the concept that what we do here, or what you happen to be doing in your particular university or hospital or what is the best, what could be the best. So I took the opportunity to spend a number of years in Uppsala, Sweden and do my PhD there. Sala, Sweden is an amazing place. It's an old uh, city. Uh, it's where the kings of Sweden used to um, uh, reign from. Uh, the kings are uh, buried there, uh, as are many, many uh, various uh, Viking lords. This happens to be the cathedral. Um, and it, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a, it was a beautiful place to spend a number of years. Um, my supervisor at that time was a, uh, a physician by the name of Carl Arforce. He again was one of these incredible individuals that you get to meet every once in a while. And his father had been a Protestant minister. He left home when he was about 15 or 16. Uh, started working in uh, lumber yards. Eventually I started driving truck, uh, became an artist, uh, made his way through university by um, doing various portraits and other art. Uh, like like uh, activities, uh, and then I got his PhD and um, uh, worked at the University of Uppsala, uh, particularly in the area of uh, physiology and uh, surgery. And he was an amazing individual. He was a, a gourmet cook. Uh, I certainly didn't learn that from him. He loved art and uh, was quite a collector of various types of art, and he also liked like science. And uh, one of the things I learned from him was that uh, his belief was that when the student came into his office and sat down and told him that he was not correct, that his ideas were wrong, and this is the reason, um, he felt that he had done his job in moving that particular uh, student to a new level. Now, during that time period, uh, the individual who worked with me was uh, a uh, technician by the name of Gunnell, and her birthday came about. And I'm going to read this poem just because it gives you an idea of what the time was like in Sweden. It was a bit different. And, uh, and this happened to be, uh, her birthday was in autumn, obviously, and this, this was the poem related to that. Autumn has come to Sweden, and the leaves are heavy with the dew of time. Like warring paintbrushes, the trees fill their colors, covering the earth with leafy flowers. A wind whispers through the veil, and all forlorn ears turn to hear its tale. For it tells of Gunnell's birthday party and the gathering from near and far in the valley. Out from their caverns came the fairy queens, and from the dark woods came the dwarfs of gleam. From the high mountains, the trolls came a prancing, and from the seashores, the mermaids a dancing. The Viking kings in their graves of old hear this news and are no longer cold. The birds of the skies sing their song with glee, and the bells of the churches begin to toll for thee. The warriors have come from their castles on high, and so, my friend, have you come, you and I, to celebrate this birthday with merriment and song, and to hope that the happiness goes on and on. To you, Colonel, we wish great joy and fame for all of us and our friends that light the flame 
May your life be filled with happiness so deep that the joy in your heart will you forever keep. So you can get an idea that that particular time period in, in Sweden was a, a time period of um, very um, joyful time period, let me put it that way. And uh, it reminds me every time I see the pictures of the, uh, the castle and see the pictures of Uppsala, the time we spent there. Now, there's something quite interesting about There's the music of the brain and, and so of neurosurgery too, but the real question of what is the music of medicine that excites you? What, what, what really does excite you related to, uh, to medicine? What really does excite you related to life? And how are you going to fulfill that excitement, whatever it happen, happens to be? And there are pitfalls and there are substantial challenges. I think I've told this story before, but I always, I always find it interesting to tell. When I was uh, in, started my surgical career, I was out for about a month. And when I went into the surgeon's sort of dressing room, I noticed that one of the anesthetists was drinking from a bottle. Uh, he looked at me and he said, um, you won't tell anybody, will you? And I said, uh, nothing. Uh, I really didn't know what to say. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, what I maybe should do is I'll talk with the chief of neurosurgery about what I've seen and maybe ask his advice. And I asked his advice and he said, well, did you, was anybody else there? I said, no. Uh, are you sure it was alcohol? I said, I was pretty sure I could smell it. Um, he said, well, you know what's gonna happen? It's gonna be your word against his. He is a senior and he's just much, much older and has many more contacts than you do. And um, in the end, it won't be you that will be an issue, but it will be an issue that if you try to get one of your patients on at night or try to get your patient on in an emergency situation, there may be a little less interest um, in helping you uh, from um, the, your anesthesiology colleagues. So he suggested that I really don't do anything at this particular point in time. I thought about that for a while. I actually talked with my wife about that and it sounded like reasonable advice. And then what happened was that about oh, a month later, an arrest occurred in the operating room. And it happened to be in that anesthetist operating room. And it was a, an individual, a young woman who was having a very minor procedure, but the anesthetist was not there. He was out drinking and that patient died. And to this day, I, I have you know, a significant pain about it in the sense that if I, have, if I would have maybe you know, informed someone else or made another decision, that patient may not have died. But I think the mistake I made was I should have gone to the chief of anesthesiology, not to the chief of neurosurgery. And I should have outlined to the chief of anesthesiology what I saw. I couldn't prove it, but this is what I saw. And then let that individual make the decisions. It's an interesting lesson to learn later. The second thing is substantial numbers of my colleagues have gotten into trouble with alcohol or gotten into trouble with drugs. And uh, it's one of the substantial pitfalls from the stresses that are associated with, uh, with medicine. And all of you are gonna be challenged by those particular stresses. So I think you have to sort of learn and deal with those particular stresses in ways that don't involve uh, drugs, alcohol, and other sort of activities. The best way to do that is probably love and happiness. These are pictures of myself and, and my wife when we were just beginning to date. And uh, shortly after that, uh, I happened to be away uh, and uh, I wrote this poem for, for Pan. 
time has parted our hearts, divided us like a stone in a stream. The stone is but small, flooding rivulets will join again. The vortex intermixed, streams always flow to the sea. This poem was published, but as you see, I think it, I think it looks better on the printed version than on the written version in, in, uh, in the in journal that it was published in. This is Pam and I uh, in a picture just a little while ago after being married for about 47 years. So my hope for all of you is that you, you find the right person to spend your time and your life with. It may be one of the more important, if, the not, if not the most important decision that you'll ever make. I told a number of my, uh, my friends and other individuals that the best decision I ever made was to marry Pam. And I would change every other decision that I made, including going into nursery. So it's important to make the right choice as to who you want to spend your time with because that will make your life uh, filled with more joy than you can, uh, you can imagine. Other things, you have to find something else that you like. In my case, it happened to be art and a little bit of Leonardo magic, but it, it can be anything. It can be um, writing or different types of reading or different types of other activities. It doesn't really matter, but you have to find something else to fill your life because the stresses that are involved in medicine and various other activities are enough. But if you're not careful to have other activities that are able to sort of help you deal with the various stresses that your uh, particular profession is gonna be involved with, uh, it's very difficult to get through. So is medicine a calling or a job? And a few uh, weeks ago when, um, when Salvatore, uh, gave his presentation, he showed this particular um, painting of a doctor. And I'm showing it again, uh, really for, for one reason. And, you know, clearly this is, this is in the past. Here's a physician who is, uh, is obviously concerned about this child who probably has various types of uh, scarlet fever. And the reason I'm showing it is I, I saw the male father in the background in this picture very easily, but I really didn't see the mother here. And I think it, it's important, I gather, so when we, we look at paintings that we look at them very carefully, not only to show what we can see, you can see here, for example, that the light is shining off this, the lamp onto the doctor's face, onto the child. But mother and father in the background here, it is very important that each of us remember that although the patient is important, so are all the family who are associated with, with the patient and the these individuals are the ones that can help you um, deal with some of the various other problems, like everything from mental health to other activities. Just dealing with the patient sometimes does not get you very far. You have to, in some ways, deal with the whole family at times. Now, I will, I will also mention there's a certain humility that you have to have, you know, to operate on someone's brain, you know, that individual to allow you to operate on his his or her brain, is it a, is it a, you know, sort of a very special opportunity that all doctors and other individuals in the healthcare professions have. Um, patients trust them with uh, activities that they don't trust many other professions with. And therefore it's important to remember that one has to be, you have a certain humility associated with that trust. Now, the other thing, uh, again, uh, that Dr. Uh, Salvatore Pagione talked about uh, was uh, the issue of being an advocate. And um, here, uh, this is Pam and myself and uh, Steve Northey and his wife, and uh, associated with uh, our ability to uh, 
start the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. When Pam and I came back from um, from Sweden, and uh, we um, we were involved in taking care of patients who had brain tumors, uh, there wasn't an organization that um, was really available for them at that particular time period. And so Pam and Steve and I uh, considered just starting that organization, but there was a reason it occurred, and, um, and this is the reason. When Kelly was diagnosed with a brain tumor at eight years of age, it was very devastating to us as a family, of course. But I think more devastating than anything else was the fact that there was no information available to us and that it didn't seem that there was any support groups in place to count on to fall back on, any people to talk to. So it became very evident that there was a, there was a definite lack there that we had to address. Uh, Kelly died uh, uh, at that time, being an eight-year-old. And um, it, it uh, I think, accelerated, clearly accelerated our, uh, our feelings about moving ahead with the development of, uh, of an organization specifically organized for, uh, for brain tumor patients. And that ended up with the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And the organization started in 1982. Um, and I went and practiced in 1981. So it was very fast that this particular organization got started after, after coming back from, uh, from Sweden. And uh, this organization really provides uh, support, uh, support for research. And actually uh, this year has just supported our uh, research in the lab. So uh, it has been very useful on, on uh, two brain tumor patients and brain tumor research uh, throughout Canada and, uh, and in since the world too. Uh, this is interesting in the sense that one of the things that was missing uh, at the time that we, um, that we were involved in uh, the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada was a handbook. And uh, Pam, uh, Pam wrote uh, the majority of the handbook uh, for patients and the handbook uh, has uh, continued to be available for patients uh, to this day. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about life after medicine in the sense that uh, here's uh, Pam and I, we're celebrating 35 years since the Brain Tumor Foundation in Canada was, uh, was formed. So uh, we've continued to be actively involved in the Brain Tumor Foundation. Uh, we've been involved in the Ulster Library of the History of Medicine, as, as individuals know. We've also been associated with giving back. And I think that's another thing that you have to think about in the long run of your lives. How do you give back? And uh, Pam and I have uh, endowed the Women Ulster Medical Student Essay Awards uh, for the uh, Ulster Library of the History of Medicine in 2015. And um, our hope was that this award would help McGill medical students explore the historical, social, ethical, and humanistic side of medicine. Um, their investigations, uh, hopefully uh, to unravel the past, would help uh, to further understand uh, the role that medicine has played and continues to play in the enhancement of the human condition. And we've also uh, endowed another uh, group uh, associated with uh, Family Undergraduate Student Award uh, for uh, not medical students, but undergraduate students who are interested in brain tumor research. So in one way, that was our, our giving back. And uh, we continue to be involved in uh, those particular activities, which has, again, helped us uh, and continues to sort of keep us busy at this particular time period. Uh, Clearly, many of the people in the lab know that we're continuing to work on uh, the issue of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, simulation. And uh, that keeps me busy too. And this is just a picture of the, uh, some members of the artificial intelligence hive. And um, many of these uh, individuals, uh, people know, Makai is there, uh, uh, Alex is there and others, and others are, uh, have gone on to uh, throw other activities. And it's been hard to get everybody together now because of COVID, but hope that, that we'll soon have everybody in the lab together and we can take more pictures. Um, I've also uh, mentioned this before that Leonardo had said that it was a mediocre pupil who didn't excel as master. Leonardo's a bit of an outlier, so no, none of his students excelled him. But for the individuals in the group here, who I'm sure many of you are gonna end up becoming teachers, um, 
One can comment that it is a mediocre teacher, teacher whose pupils do not excel him or her. And I think your goal is to help students get better. In other words, be better than you can possibly be. That's one of the goals that all teachers should have. And again, the concept of, of a happy life, uh, children, grandchildren, and hopefully if one lives long enough, great grandchildren. So, well, Valerie said this about Leonardo da Vinci, uh, what a person leaves after him are the dreams that his name inspires and the works that make his name a symbol of admiration. So it looks like through life, you have to have two things. You have to have the idea that, that your work inspires other individuals and you also have to have done something. So you have to have works also, so a combination of the two. So we all have beginnings and we are gonna have endings. And I wish for all of you um, to live long and prosper in spa, let's say. But I think I'll finish with this. One time when I was sitting along the, um, the lake, this came to my mind. The sound will pound on the eardrum of time forever. I thought about how to put this into a poem and I'm still considering it. And hopefully at some point I will be able to put this particular sentence into a, into a poem. But in one way, it stands a bit by itself too. So my hope would be that the sound that each of you uh, make will pound on the eardrum of not only time, but the eardrum of humanity forever and ever. So that's the end of my particular presentation.